This is Agent Provocateur with Alan Walsh and Adam Wilde. Welcome to another episode of Agent Provocateur. We have a really, really special guest with us today. Uh, a noted client, originally from Gothenburg, Sweden. He's now playing for the Toronto Maple Leafs, drafted 91st overall in the 2014 NHL draft by the Edmonton Oilers. He's taken a circuitous route to Toronto uh, through uh, uh, a lot of non-traditional uh, areas that we will discuss for a player coming from Sweden. Let's give a big welcome to William Lagason. Yeah, let's go. Thanks. First active Toronto Maple Leaf player to ever be on an SDPN show. Well, so thank you for for being our first. Thank you very much. Yeah, a Adam, are you going to be okay? I'm going to be all right. I'm going to be all right. <laughs> all right. I'm going to be all right. Listen, I'm in all my right. 30s. I got to I got to at least pretend not to be a fanboy all the time. You know. <laughs> There's always a little bit of a back and forth between Adam and I uh, and Jesse and Steve regarding yeah. uh, their Toronto Maple Leaf. Uh, fandom. Uh, I'm, I'm a little guilty, Will, because, uh, I, you know, being born and raised in Montreal, um, when the Montreal Canadiens used to lose a game, which was very rare in the 1970s, I used to run to my bedroom crying. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was a long, long time ago, but, uh, still, uh, still remember every one of those losses. Uh, so it's great to have you here today. Uh, thank you for making the time. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's 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 truly a, a, a great pleasure. Uh and I, I want to start off by just uh asking you, you can tell us a little bit about how you got involved in hockey to begin with. Um, you know, hockey's big in Sweden. I've been there many times. Uh Gothenburg is is an amazing place to start playing hockey. How did you originally get into the sport? Um so when I was young, like uh, my parents, they uh, they took me to some uh, games back in Sweden in the SHL. Like uh, watched me, I watched, I got to watch the Frölunda play there. And uh, as a young kid, I thought, it's, I, I don't know, I don't know exactly, but they they have told me that I, after I watched those games, I I begged them to start playing, and they were like, uh, I wish you wait a little bit, like wait a little bit, and then. And for uh, and unfortunately, I got to. They took me to. Uh, they took me to start because I had a lot of a lot of other like friends and stuff that played too. So uh, I got to play when I was like uh, started five six years old. They took me to practice there and uh, and I was hooked right away. So uh, that's kind of how I how I started to to get into to the hockey. Did you play any other sports growing up? Yeah, so uh, soccer has always been a big, uh, big thing for me too. Uh, I had a lot of friends that playing soccer, and I feel like soccer is a little bit more uh, like uh, I don't know, like baseball over in in US and stuff. Like everyone seems to to have played baseball once in their life. So um, uh, soccer is the national sport here. So um, I uh, I played that uh, combined with hockey until I was like. Uh, I would say like 14, 15 maybe, and then I, uh, the both sports get more serious and I had to take a decision there. And it was a hard decision actually, because uh, I, I liked both sports a lot and I feel like I was almost equally good in, in both sports and even maybe a little bit better in soccer at that time. But uh, I think uh, I think I thought like hockey was a little bit more fun to, to play. So that... that that's why I, I chose uh, hockey, and then uh, I went with that. So uh, you did something that was kind of rare at the time for players um, playing hockey in Sweden, and that is you ended up in the USHL uh, as opposed to staying in Sweden uh, and continuing on there, uh, J18, J20, uh, SHL, here you are in the United States Hockey League, 
and you played for Dubuque. So here you are in Dubuque, Iowa. How did you get there? Yeah, so um, like you said, I was playing there for Frölundas, like J started U16, played U18, U20. And then I felt like I was kind of like uh, ready to take the next step after that uh, that year in U20. But uh, but the step to to play for the the big team there was was kind of big, and I saw a lot of players went up there and they didn't get to play that much. And I knew that was that was something that I thought was like important to to keep playing a lot during that age. So. Um, my agent at the time like uh, recommended this route to to go over and uh, play one one year in ushl and maybe go the college route and uh, i was a little skeptical at first i didn't know uh, a lot of players i didn't know like what that would be like and stuff like that and i i remember like uh, at that time i was uh, i was looking up like uh, some players that i went went there like car Hagelin, douglas murray and christian fallin and few players and I looked at like how like what route they took and stuff like that and they went the college route and it worked out good for them and stuff like that so um so I was like yeah let's do it and then um uh, and then he put my my name out there and there was a USHL draft and uh, I got drafted to Dubuque there and uh, and uh, then I took the decision to to go over and play play one year in USHL and yeah and after um, after your year in the USHL, you got a scholarship to UMass and ended up playing NCAA. Um, what was that transition like for you? Uh, I think the toughest part was the was the school. Like uh, I, uh, my English at the time wasn't wasn't very good and uh, stuff like that. So I think the the language part was was really challenging for me. Uh, but I made it work, and uh, and uh, hockey wise, like I always felt like com- comfortable at the rink, you know, like the the locker room, like hockey is hockey uh, everywhere, wherever you go in the world. So uh, I always always loved coming to the rink, practice, hanging out with the boys, like playing games and stuff like that. And I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I went there two two years at the uh, UMass and I had a had a good time there. Maybe I wish that team was doing a little bit better uh, than it was but uh for me personally i was growing as a person and as a player so uh, uh looking back i didn't don't regret anything and uh thought it was a was a fun fun time what did you major in there uh so i was about to because i was taking a lot of like gen ed classes at the start just to get them out of the way and then after my second year i was supposed to take uh, to choose a major but uh, i was about to take uh, sports psychology but i never i never ended up uh, taking a major because uh, i left after two years so um yeah so you you ended up signing with edmonton after your second year at umass and then uh took another non-traditional uh, decision in that you sign with Edmonton and instead of going directly to play in the American Hockey League, you went back to Sweden. Right. What was, what, what, what was going on there that, that made you decide with Edmonton to do that? So when I signed with Edmonton that year, they had a lot of... Uh, a lot of prospects, a lot of D-men. So we kind of took that decision with the, with the team and uh, and myself to to go to a place where I got to play a lot. So I think I think it was a good good decision both for me and for the team. So they didn't didn't have to rotate between a lot of guys, and maybe I would be one of them to to not play every, every game and stuff like that. And uh, uh, so yeah, because I remember they signed uh, I think Caleb Jones and Ethan Bear that year too, and they had some older guys. And I don't remember, but uh, I think it was a it was a good decision to go go play in one year in in uh, Jew Gordon like I did there and uh, play a lot of minutes. Uh, I mean, it's a good league. Like uh, uh, so, had a great year too. Like uh, so, I think it was 
That was a good decision. And then after that, you end up in Bakersfield, California, of all places. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bit of a change. Yeah, absolutely. I was... Uh, City-wise wasn't maybe not the best, but uh, the weather was great. And I mean, uh, when I went there, like the we had a like the team was probably one of the closest team I've I've been a part of. Like uh, I think it was a great great group of guys. We had uh, we had a good team, so it made it a lot of fun. We we were winning a lot of games, and uh, I think we had like uh, I think it was like second longest winning streak or something like that in AHL history um, so uh, it was a lot of fun even though like uh, it was uh, like you said a special place to make feel and stuff like that but uh, I enjoyed it okay so uh, you and I met for the first time when you were playing in Bakersfield and a lot of people you mentioned you had a, a previous agent um, a lot of people um, always have asked me over the years, when did you first meet this player or how did you get involved in working for a particular player? Um, what was your overall um, thinking with regard to agents? And, and you know, it's probably a question that Adam would ask, but I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to ask myself what, what made, I know why I wanted to work with you. Mm -hmm. But what made you want to work with me? Um, so I remember first time we met, like uh, I I didn't have any like any expectation. Like I I was pretty committed to my agent at the time. Like I I wanted to to work with him and be loyal to him. So I didn't have any 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 thoughts to to switch an agent or anything like that. But. Um, I like to keep all the all the doors open and be open minded and, and see what you had to offer and stuff like that too. So uh, yeah, we met there and uh, and uh, then during that that was my second year in uh, in Bakersfield. Right. I was I wasn't too happy about uh, about my situation there. And uh, when I asked my agent and stuff like that at the time, he because he was working in in Sweden and. Uh, then he connected me with another agent that I didn't have the best relationship over in North America. So um, that can kind of made me. That was my first thought. Like maybe maybe I, it's time for me to to switch in and try something new for me. And um, uh, yeah. So then uh, then I called you up and, and said like uh, yeah let's let's do this. So. Um, that was that was about it, I think. Yeah, Adam. Well, I, I wanted to ask you about um, about your time in Bakersfield, um, and specifically uh, just um, what you think. Like, because I'm, I'm imagining this. Okay, so you grew up in Sweden, which is a pretty similar climate to or climate to what Toronto is, right? Cold, dark in the winter. Right. Iowa would be cold and dark in the winter too. I would expect, yeah. right? You're yeah. in Bakersfield. You're playing for Jay Woodcroft, by the way, I believe. If I if I'm if I got uh, yeah, if I got my coaches matched up, and you're playing in the sunshine, was it was it kind of a a weird thing for you to leave the arena and be in your flip flops? Like, did that kind of feel a bit strange? Hundred percent. I, uh, I first thought I was gonna miss the, all the season, like the the winter, the snow, like all that, but. Uh, like when the time went, went along and like uh, throughout November, December, and it was still like pretty, pretty decent weather. I was like, okay, like I don't miss the, miss the snow. <laughs> like I thought it was uh, pretty nice uh, to not uh, put on a winter jacket and boots uh, and every time you had to go out. So uh, I, I actually enjoyed the weather a lot. So. Uh, That's why Alan left Montreal and now lives in Los Angeles. I think. I think. Yeah, yeah. part of the reason. <laughs> yeah, it's the perpetual suntan. Oh, jealous! Yeah. Jealous! Yeah. Of you. yeah. So, um, you are now playing for the Toronto Maple Leafs. Um, you had uh, some ups and downs in Edmonton, mm -hmm. and. You moved to Montreal, 
and last year uh, spent uh, the whole year with Chicago in the American Hockey League. And uh, you approach unrestricted free agency and signed um, right at the beginning of free agency with the Toronto Maple Leafs. Uh, what went into your decision making to sign with Toronto? Uh, I think from the office I had, I think uh, that was my like my best opportunity to to make to get my, myself back to NHL. So uh, yeah, I mean, I had a good. Uh, conversation with you and stuff like that too so um that was about it to take the decision based on based on the opportunity i would have to to make it an nhl again how's it working out so far it's good yeah it's good is what do you what do you like about toronto um I love the city. City is awesome. I've uh, I've good memories from here. I uh, played uh, World Juniors here, so 2014, 15, I believe. Uh, yep. uh, so I've been here a little bit before, and um, and um, yeah, I like the city. I like uh, there's some some Swedes some Swedes here that I that I know a little bit before, which uh, which always helps and. Uh, uh, great teammates and all like all of that, so it makes it makes it a lot easier to to get settled and and get uh, get comfortable here. Now you you played um, in Edmonton, a Canadian city, with a lot of media attention. You're now playing in Toronto, um, the center of the hockey universe, with an incredible amount of media attention. Do you like that? Uh, I would say both yes and no. When it, when it's going good, yeah. When it's going bad, no. Like yeah. <laughs> but what, what, I, what I learned from uh, from the Edmonton time, I was I was more into media. I was reading a lot and, and stuff like that. And uh, that kind of like when you read like bad stuff about yourself and stuff like that, it kind of like drags you down a little bit. So ever since then, I haven't. I haven't read anything like I'm never on Twitter uh, like so I I just like kind of ignore it like I and that's that's what my way to handle it like I just don't like don't read anything like yeah uh, so just focus on myself that's that's all I can do like focus on uh, what, I, what I can control and, and try to play as good and prepare myself and all, all that so um so we kind of yeah i mean it's kind of like uh, maybe it's like yeah, playing a little bit of, uh, it wouldn't wouldn't matter if i play here or anywhere else like if you don't if you don't follow it that much so um yeah that's my that's that's how i do it at least uh favorite restaurant oh. in toronto good question wow uh Uh, that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> I've been to a few, but I, uh, I'm so bad. I'm so bad at names. Like, I can't. I can't remember like the places I, I go to that much. Um, I have to come back to that one. Okay. Okay. So, um, your tell us a little bit about your your personal life. Um, you're married. And uh, yep. you fairly recently became a father. Why don't yep. you talk to us a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, married obviously to my to my wife, uh, uh, two thousand and twenty. So uh, two and a half years. Uh, How'd you guys meet? We got to know the story. Yeah, so we we met in college actually. Uh, oh yeah. Oh cool. Yeah. So at UMass, uh, uh, my uh, we started, uh, yeah, my first year there, we started dating and then, uh, we had, uh, one year distance when I, when I played in Jurgården, but then after that, she has been, she has been with me since that. So, wow. 
we are uh, yeah we are uh, been together for what is it eight eight years now maybe or something like that does umass mean she's a bruins fan uh, <laughs> I don't know if she's any fan. She is, she is the fan I'm, I'm uh, the team I play for. Oh, obviously. that's good. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> now, now you met your wife at UMass, but she's she's from Sweden. Yeah. So oh, her, her okay. Sweden, but she uh, she grew up in New Jersey. Um, so yeah, so she is she has dual citizenship actually. So uh, yeah. Uh, so it was a pretty, pretty good coincidence to, to meet her there. So she speaks Swedish, like yeah, and everything like that too. And uh, so it's, uh, yeah, it's been it's been working out good. And how old is your little boy or little girl? Uh, so I got a, a boy uh, last uh, or this February. So he's uh, ten months uh, soon. Okay, is he standing yet? Yeah, he's uh, standing, like climbing and crawling, but he's not quite walking yet. But uh, Doing the, the the wobble a little bit. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, I heard he's been blocking shots now for about two months. <laughs> yeah. Got to start him early, eh? Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And uh, uh, there are a lot of guys uh, playing in Toronto who like to live downtown as opposed to out, um, you know, a ways a bit from the practice rink. Uh, what part of town are you living in right now? So I live at, in uh, Humber Bay. So that's kind of like Beautiful. halfway between downtown and, and practice rink we have out there. So um, my first first month, uh, we we thought it was going to be pretty easy to find a place, a big city, like... It's, uh, you know, like you wait to the last month and then you start looking and you'd be like, holy, like it's, uh, it's not easy to find like the right place in the right, right area. Like for, you got to rent it for this um, amount of months. And so we uh, ended up uh, having an Airbnb downtown the first, first month to get us a little bit more time to, to find a place. And then uh, we found this one and we thought it would be a good, uh, good location uh just because it's not like just downtown we have a dog too so it'd be nice to be a little bit uh outside the city and uh so we we decided this one and when we moved in here we were surprised because it was like i thought it was really really nice like we can walk down to the lake here like having the dog and the kids so we w take a lot of walk a lot of walks uh, during the day and stuff like that so uh so it's a perfect perfect area for us i think so it's uh yeah it was good adam I, I well i gotta ask you about uh, about being a swedish player playing in toronto because you know i'm, I'm not i wanted to kind of ask you about you know in terms of nhl brands or nhl teams that are big over there i would assume the leafs are up there um you know Big name, Boris Salming, Matt Sundin, William Nylander, you know, Jonas Hoagland, uh, Hammerstrom in the 70s, big Swedish connections. Were, were you uh, tuned into? Was it was it special to come to the Leafs? Does it matter uh, to your friends and family over there that it's the Leafs? I'm, I'm, not, I'm purely coming at this from a very biased Leafs point of view, but I wanted to see, you know, kind of, you know, with the Swedish series and all the special things that happened there, I uh, wanted to know what, what kind of mark the Toronto Maple Leafs have in Sweden? Yeah, a good question. I uh, I think it's uh, like for for people that are very interested in hockey, uh, they are thinking it's super cool. Like the Toronto's favorite team, and you know, obviously, like you said, Burry Sami has been big impact and stuff like that. But uh, some other play or some other uh, uh, people that are not super interested, they're like, uh, yeah, they don't. Really, <laughs> they thought it's cool. It's NHL, but it's not like it's not as mad as Toronto or or, or on any other team, you know. But uh, but it was cool. Now when we went to Sweden a few a few weeks ago, like we uh, could really tell that we went to that Boris Salmon premiere. They made a show there, and there was a lot of like people like showing it, like just to see like how how big of an impact he he was uh, and stuff like that I, I he was a little bit before my my time so i didn't i didn't quite know like 
how big he was and how big influence he was and stuff like that. But um, so it was really cool to see, and especially going back to Sweden now, like uh, and being on that premiere and stuff like that. It was uh, it was super special. So it was. And your uh, family seeing you play up front in Sweden would have been pretty cool too, I would think. Yeah, that was uh, that was super cool. Actually, it was. Uh, uh, it's like opportunity to get a w- once a life, so it's uh, it was super cool. And they went up there and got to hang out with them, with them a little bit stuff. So it was uh, it was special. Uh, what was the experience for you going back there uh, and being in uh, being in Sweden and being around your family and playing actual league games? in the uh regular season uh over there you know a lot of teams have gone over in preseason and play uh games near the end of training camp uh the games don't really have any significance um in the standings it's more just to spread the nhl word and get people interested in the game but here you're going over and you're playing actual regular season games. Um, what was that like for you to be experiencing that? You know, it's not preseason. It's not exhibition games. These are league games. And, and you're back in your home country around your family and friends. Uh, talk to us about that. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was a su- super cool experience, like going there, like, uh especially like to get like friends family coming and actually watch me because they haven't i have a lot of friends that haven't watched me play alive since since back at uh, the time in, in jugord and so so have them come up there and and uh, watch me play like nhl games it was uh it was special it was super cool and and i got to start the games stuff like that and i thought it was like uh, super cool like they were super excited for me and they thought it was a uh, really cool experience because they have, I have friends that uh, I've been growing up with since I was little and they they just have been following me uh, everywhere I go and uh, and uh, see me working hard and stuff like that and to for them to to come there and see me play actual and in a child games in in Stockholm uh, that was yeah, that was special and something I will and I think for for them to 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 remember for for a very long time. So uh, yeah, it was like I said, once in a lifetime experience. How many tickets do you have to buy for every game? <laughs> uh, obviously for my family and then uh, then a couple for my friends too. So yeah, it was about. Not too, too, not like, not like Newlander. He bought like 90 or something, but uh, I had like 10 or 15 or something. So yeah. for each game. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So Newlander was buying 90 tickets per game. Yeah. Uh, or <laughs> or something like that, but he, he had a lot of family. He's from there and stuff. So, uh, and he has a big family. So uh, it was Something like that, but uh, he had a lot of a lot of tickets. William, when people were over there, uh, it was really interesting to see kind of the culture clash because there's so much about Sweden um, and North America that are similar, and there's so much that's different. And uh, I think people were trying out the different foods. One of our one of the guys, Steve Dangle from our network, was over there trying out the the meatballs and and everything else. But um, everybody kept talking about the beer with garlic in it. Uh, can you explain that one? Have you had that the garlic beer? Because that was supposed to be like a Swedish staple, and I I needed to ask somebody from there, is that something that they just kind of tell tourists, or is that a real thing? Uh, I don't even know. I don't. You don't know? I'm, okay. <laughs> garlic beer? No, I don't. I don't think that's a Swedish thing. I know uh, taking like snaps. That's like some shots, like yeah, aqua wheat and stuff like that. That's like heavy liquor for like midsummer or christmas and stuff like that that's typical sweden but uh don't know don't know about that don't know uh, about this garlic beer because what they it would literally be like a pint and there'd be garlic at the bottom of it so weirdest uh, thing i've ever seen yeah i've never seen it before so i just thought i'd ask you okay that's probably something they just sell to tourists then alan go ahead okay so uh and we talked about this i'm going over to gothenburg for the world juniors this year 
be going over uh, just after Christmas. For somebody like me going over there, and I've been to Gothenburg several times in the past, but let's say for a second I've never been there before. What do I need to do? What do I need to see when I get there? Uh, Gothenburg should probably... Uh, that's a tough question, but you try out a lot, a lot of food. I know, like uh, one of my favorite uh, food things in Sweden is like um, it's kind of like a shrimp, uh, uh, shrimp uh, toast, kind of. Uh, they have a lot of good seafood, but obviously, like try out the meatballs and stuff like that, and. Uh, they have a big uh, roller coaster park. Uh, I know they have a lot of. It's kind of like a Christmassy vibe in there. If you go in there, it's kind of like, uh, yeah, you can buy a lot of stuff in there, I guess. And if you want to, if you want to roll, uh, go on a roller coaster in in the winter, you can do that too. Maybe you can do that. <laughs> wow. You big roller coaster guy, Alan? Uh, hey, I'm always willing to, you know, be a be a daredevil and and go do that kind of stuff. We're gonna have to strap so, a GoPro to you. Well, it'll be um, it, it'll be pretty dark there uh, <laughs> at that time of year. Yeah. So the 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 flip side is in the summer, uh, you know, July. How many hours of uh, daylight do you have a day there? Uh, yeah, like you said, winter is is dark. So I, if I recommend anyone going to Sweden, I would I would say go in the summer because that's uh, that's way better. But uh, <laughs> Summer is uh, sun goes probably up like five maybe four or five and then it goes down eleven eleven wow. thirty so it's uh, it's pretty it's pretty nice now like uh, when I had the baby like uh, last February and and uh, in the summer I uh, put him to sleep at like around six o'clock and then had a little dinner and then I could always sneak out and, and play a nine holes of golf. Like, cause it's fun. <laughs> so, it worked, worked out good for me because, uh, I didn't get too much, uh, too much 18 holes rounds during the day, but I could always, uh, when the sun stays up, I could sneak out, uh, uh late red night when the, when the sun was uh, still up. So smart, yeah. smart. So golf is golf, is, find a way. Is, is golf a big thing in, in Sweden right now? Uh, yeah, there's a lot of uh, a lot of golfers. I think it took uh, it took real off after that COVID. Everyone seem everyone seems to start playing golf after that, and then. Uh, uh, but it's uh, yeah, it's big in Sweden. I would say. What's your handicap? My handicap is twelve. That's pretty good. It's yeah. A, yeah. That's uh, pretty good. Yeah. Uh, what's yeah. the best course you've ever played? Best course. Uh, Uh, maybe Sweden has uh, some good, like in Gothenburg. I don't, I haven't played like super like fancy courses, I think, but uh, I played some good in Sweden. It's one is called Valda and one is called Hills. I think those, those are the two best in uh, where I'm from and they're, they're nice. So, but uh, I don't know if I played any like, uh, like really super fancy courses over here. So, yeah. Well, we just always assume, right? NHL player gets to play the best courses, right? So, <laughs> yeah. Alan, what's your handicap? Um, I, I, I don't necessarily have one. Is let me tell you. Good? Let me tell you my golf story. Okay. Um, if you're going to play golf, you have to practice a lot, right? You're not just going to be able to go in and play two or three times a summer and be any good. So I would go out and I would break a club by the third hole and by the fourth or fifth hole, I'd be storming off uh, and and packing it in for the day. Um, you know, when I see that ball slicing over like that, I'm like, that's it, I'm done. <laughs> and uh, the only real way to play it and 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 do right by it is to practice and I just don't have the time, especially in the summer, to do that. Um, you know, maybe, maybe later in life, but uh, <laughs> it ain't happening right now. Uh, William, 
I'm looking at I'm looking at your career here so far, and uh, and there's you know I'm looking at like last year specifically. He had ten goals last year in the A, right? If mm-hmm. I, have, I have that right. And I'm looking at the NHL one, and I'm and and I'm I think you're still looking if I'm correct for your first NHL goal. Is that right? That is right. Yeah. Have you had any fantasies? Because I could tell you I had fantasies about it when I was a kid. Have you had any fantasies about that puck finally going in and how that's going to feel for you? How great that's going to feel? Yeah, I think, think about it all the time. So, uh, no, but yeah, it was, I'm still waiting for it, but uh, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. You've been close. You've been close. Yeah, I've been really close uh, multiple times, but uh, we'll see. Like, we'll see. You- at the right time. I know. I know you're supposed to act like you've been there as an NHL player, but do you think that you'll you'll let yourself kind of celebrate a little bit more because it's the first one? Like it feels like that would be a really big deal. Uh, yeah. I mean, we'll we'll see how the game goes. Though, too, maybe if we're down a couple of goals and there's a minute left, I'm not gonna get down. <laughs> on my but if there's a big goal in the game, you're not doing the knee slide across the ice. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but if it's an overtime winner, you got to do it. Okay. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, the one thing I've always wondered, and I think a lot of people do is, you know, NHL players, um, have incredible interests, hobbies, um, incredible backstories, and I think the NHL generally does a terrible job in um, revealing players' personalities, creating identities and brands around them, which can be, you know, that's what you market. That's what you market. So when I have players on, uh, everyone can see you play on the ice, but how can people get to know who you are behind the scenes? So let's start with this. What kind of music do you like? Um, I like kind of like pop, um, pop rock, I would say. R&B. You have Rap. a favorite, favorite go-to in your, uh, in your Spotify playlist? Uh, not really. I, I kind of like listen to a, a lot of different genres and a lot of different artists and stuff like that. But uh, uh, so I don't really have a specific type. But uh, if I if I want to get pumped up for a game, I'm I'm gonna listen to more pump up music and maybe a little bit house like stuff like that. And if I want to chill, like I'm listening to like I don't know like chill music Adele or something like that. You know, like so. Uh, I have a big span, so I don't. I'm not like. And now Christmas comes, you're gonna listen to Christmas music for for <laughs> for months straight. So, um, yeah, I would say, say I like, I don't know, a little bit of everything. I would say. Okay, coolest place you've ever traveled to. Um, gotta go with uh, Australia. Mm-hmm. Uh, went there when I was. I think seven, seven, eight. So I uh, don't remember too, too much, but uh, I've seen seen some like videos and pictures and that kind of reminds me when I was there, like went to Barrier Reef and there was snorkeling there and stuff like that. So it was, uh, and when I was younger too, I loved like animals and I loved like the na- nature kind of stuff. So it was uh, to go there and see see all the different animals and kangaroo and like, uh, yeah, like sharks and, and everything. And, and it was, uh, it was a cool experience. Well, you mentioned sharks and I know that, um, for a couple of years in a row, you've caught a shark in Sweden. <laughs> yeah. So a couple of years back, one of my, one of my best friends back home, he's super into like hunting and fishing and all that. So he always, uh, take me on some, some, uh, crazy hunting things and, and and fishing things too but uh uh we i know he tried like a couple of years back uh and because he he heard from someone that you could uh, catch a shark uh, at this place in sweden so 
uh, he went there once and he never caught anything and then i don't know how i uh, heard it or something but maybe like he told me or i heard it from someone else but i was like i was like on him so bad i was like for a whole summer i was like we have to go like we're gonna cut we're gonna catch fun and he was like oh, i've tried like there's there's no chance like and then for a whole summer i was begging him and we never never did it that summer but the next summer i was like okay this summer we have to go like you have to promise me and he was like okay and it's kind of like far it's kind of like an hour you have like a smaller boat uh so we had to wait for uh for a good time where there's like no wind so so we could we could go out there and when both me and him had uh, had time to do it too so we found that day and uh, me him and another one of my other good friends uh went out there and um he had prep everything so we started fishing there and like when when like half an hour like 45 minutes didn't catch anything but and then and then finally like i rem- i don't remember who caught it but someone someone like like had like something on the hook and it was like oh like, like i got something like <laughs> like heavy <laughs> was, we were like and everyone got so excited and he was uh like taking up and taking up and it was heavy and like uh, and then he took it up and it was like a lot smaller shark and then we caught like two three of, the, of them and then and then finally we caught like a like a big one and there was uh it was it was amazing i didn't know like you could catch like like a big shark in sweden so uh now we have been going out there uh we did it this summer too so t- twice in a row now and and caught some sharks which is uh just pretty cool. Very when you cool. say a big shark, how big are we talking here? I mean, we're, we're not talking uh, a great white, but uh, we're talking <laughs> big for Sweden. I don't know. It's probably like, uh, say like 15, 20 kilos. Maybe that's like yeah, 40, 40, 50 pounds, maybe, I would say. And that's a lot to, to reel in. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, it is. And especially that's heavy. For- for the size of the boat too and the the, the we had like a, a boat with like uh i don't know how to say it in english but it's kind of like uh the outside is kind of like rubber and you 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 pump it up kind of it's one of those boats yeah and it has like uh some like something on the back like kind of like sharp uh sharp things on the back so when when we were when we were going back that day, he, the, he could tell like the boat was like kind of like it was not like it was not like hard anymore. It was kind of like sinking in a little bit, and and then so he, he found like a couple of holes, and he said it was so hard to find these tiny holes in the boat, and he had to like replace some some patches on on the boat there. But uh, wow! Uh, so this year when we went out, we, we were a little bit more careful with that. So. <laughs> 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 I didn't know that. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. So I, I I told you in one of our conversations that I'm coming to Gothenburg again also in the summer, uh, because I'm gonna take you to a Bruce Springsteen concert with the <laughs> E Street Band playing in the big stadium uh there. Um have you seen any concerts in Sweden? Yeah, uh, this year I actually went to to Coldplay. That's uh, might have been one of my one of my favorite uh, concerts ever. It was it was unbelievable. Like they, I don't know if you ever been to one, but they do like kind of like bands around your wrist with like kind of lights, and uh, they're controlling the lights through through the arena. So it's it looks uh, super cool like when they when they play the music and, it, and it's kind of like a big light show at the same time so um when i was younger i we always went to uh it's kind of like uh it's called summer burst it was more like uh house music uh, um i think like swedish house mafia like uh, david guetta and, and uh, yeah 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 Guys, that concert and uh yeah that's that's quite about it well there's a famous story about uh springsteen and the e street band early 80s in uh, gothenburg um during the encore the people were jumping up and down and they broke 
the stadium. <laughs> they literally broke the stadium. And it's a famous story in Springsteen lore. Bruce and the band come to Gothenburg and they break the stadium. Uh, so I, I think there's a new stadium now for soccer, correct? Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. Well, it's because of Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, sometimes the way you see um, soccer fans or even like European hockey fans are unbelievable. Like they're loud and the chants and everything. Sometimes on TikTok, I'll see like, you could see kind of everything sort of bending when everybody's jumping up and down at the same time. I, I wondered, uh, Will, did, did you have a favorite soccer team growing up and do you still follow them now? Um, so it was when growing up, my, my dad was, uh, he grew up a little bit outside of Gothenburg and, uh, and uh, my friends, they were kind of like diehard uh, EFK Gothenburg. That's from, that's the team in Gothenburg. Mm -hmm. And I always thought, uh, because the team what, where, where my dad was from, they were kind of like a little bit better at that time. So I thought it was more fun to root, rooting for them cause to like beg my, my, my friends a little bit to be like, yeah. Uh, uh, so I always like was a little bit on that side. But at the same time, I kind of liked the, the Gothamu team uh, a little bit too. So I kind of had uh, two teams that I was rooting for a little bit. But uh, now I always try to go to at least uh, one... Uh, EFK Gothenburg uh, game um, during the summer when I'm when I'm there because it's uh, I mean the atmosphere in there is is unbelievable. It's uh, like you said they're jumping and they have like a big section with the crazy fans with like waves and uh, stuff like that and they're singing all game. So it's uh, it's always a good time when I go there. That's cool. Great stuff. Well, listen, um, we've held you hostage long enough. Yep. And uh, I I think I heard Louie in the background yeah. uh, maybe taking a nap and starting to wake up. Uh, so uh, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing an hour of your day with us and agreeing to come on. And uh, it's been amazing to visit with you and to hear a little bit about your background and introduce you to uh, the fans in Toronto and the fans around the NHL. So thank you and uh, keep, keep it going, buddy. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. This has been Agent Provocateur with Alan Walsh and Adam Wild. Follow Alan Walsh on Twitter at Walsh A. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts by searching Agent Provocateur and hitting the subscribe button. YouTube.com slash SDPN.